are now live. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar where we'll be looking at the Belvin reports, the intelligence that your team needs. Like I've said before, my name's Joe Keeler and I'm the Managing Director here at Belvin. We have Tracy with us um, who is behind the scenes and she is our Marketing Manager. So if you have any questions or anything you'd like to contribute at all, Belvin related, um, please do pop it in the comments and we will either get back to you or perhaps Tracy will tell me to stop and answer the question straight away. That would be great. So what are we going to spend the next 45 minutes doing? Well, we're here to talk about the Belvin reports. Now, we mention these Belvin reports in every webinar. We mention them on our website. We mention them whenever we talk to people. But I've got a funny feeling that not everybody knows what the Belvin reports are, what they look like. And also, I'm not sure everybody understands how they can be used, both from an individual and a team perspective. So we're going to start looking at these reports, taking you through page by page. And we're going to do this not in a theoretical way, but also how you can use these reports if you're talking to people on a one to one or if you were running a team session. Before I go any further, though, I must say that these reports aren't new. Um, I found a presentation I gave a while back, actually. It had all a timeline on it. I need to put my glasses on now. So just to give you an idea of how long these Belvin reports have been used, um, the very first version of the reports and the interplace platform that produced the reports was in 1988. 1988, um, that was a year after Belvin Associates was formed, and it was formed with... Dr. Meredith Belbin, Nigel Belbin, and the programmer, and then a later partner, um, David Bainbridge. So the first version is 1988. Second version was 1989. It had constant improvements, and I think that's a common theme, actually. Um, then in, we had Interplace 3, um, the third version of the reports in 1990. And I've got here, that was when the addition of dongles came into being. So these little things you put in your computer to make sure that only certain people would access. Then we had the fourth version where we're using these big old floppy disks. For young people, you won't know what these are, but you used to put them in the side of the computer to make things work. Um, we had Interplace 5, the fifth um, version of the reports in 1996. And that's when we started using CDs. Um, I remember those well, actually, because in 2001, which was the year I joined Belbin, we launched Interplace 6, the sixth version, and we used to burn CDs um, and send them to all corners of the world. And with e-Interplace, it was the first time, actually, we started um, using macros for people to complete in the questionnaires and import them, import them, and we finished that with a fully online version. In 2012, we launched the seventh version of the reports and back last year, the eighth version. Um, there were new platforms, we've rebuilt everything from the, from the bottom up with these new reports. And at each time, at each of those iterations, we've constantly improved, we've listened, we've really ensured that the Belgium reports not only are measuring what they purport to measure, but the information contained within them is as useful as they can possibly be. Because although Belber may have started off many, many years ago, more as a management consultancy tool, since I've joined and, and much before then actually, is we've been really keen on ensuring that anybody, whether or not you're in your job or whether or not you're trying to be the managing director, or maybe you are the managing director, is that anybody can access the reports, anybody can use them, and therefore anybody can benefit from them. So it's really key to know that the reports are there with kind of the end user in mind. They're not there um, for extra levels of interpretation. You, you don't need a psychologist to go through and understand the reports because we've kind of put the psychologist in the report for you. We've done that interpretation for you. Okay, so we're on the eighth version. Brilliant. Been around since 1907. Fantastic. Um, okay, we're not here to give a talk about each of the team roles and the strengths and the weaknesses. We're not here to tell you all about the amazing work that was done at Henley back in the 70s and 80s. Because we've got other webinars that go into detail there, and we can send you links to those so that you, you know that we're here just to concentrate. 
Now, some of you may be familiar with Belvin because at some point in your life, you may have filled in an Excel spreadsheet. I could like that. That's not an Excel spreadsheet, is it? That's a bit of paper um, with a pencil. Um, you may have done a Belvin where you've added up the scores and referred to a table and everything. I would just like to say that that is not Belvin. So if you're still using those or you know somebody who is using them or for whatever reason, please do stop. Um, this was Belvin back in the well, early 80s. Um, we've moved on a lot since then. It's not particularly accurate, any version you're using. It's most definitely not up to date. It's not giving you advice. It's not there with the end user. It's just giving you a number. Um, it really, really isn't useful. And in fact, I would say has given Belbin the wrong impression. Um, people have felt they're just a number that's put in a box. And that's not what Belbin's about. Uh, most importantly, however, it is a breach of copyright. And we do know that people breach the copyright, we do find out. And unfortunately, the only people who benefit from us um, finding out that you breached the copyright is our IP lawyers. And I don't like making lawyers any, any richer than they already are. So please make sure you use the most up-to-date and sanctioned version of the Belvin reports. Because so many people do use them. So many people do. Um, I was going through a list of customers, um, it's, it's a very big list, and I thought I'd pick out a few. I thought you might have heard of the UN, um, the UNHCR. Lots of different bodies within the UN use Belbin, um, especially when they're trying to put teams together really quickly because um, they need to deploy really quickly. So the UN use Belbin, the NHS, TikTok, um, <laughs> Sanofi, lots of pharmaceutical companies. I think they like the, the data behind and, and the scientific um, rigor of the, of the theory. Um, Sanofi, Novo Nordisk. Um, Eli Lilly, um, a small company called Alibaba. I don't know if they're still the largest company in the world. I'm not sure. It changed a few years ago, didn't it? Um, and we've also got people like PGL, um, Nissan, Fujifilm, so, some great startups. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Oppo Ice Cream. It's in Tesco. So it's in the chiller. Obviously, it's ice cream. I can't believe I said that. Um, but anyway, a wonderful startup, a great ice cream. Um, they use this because they want to grow quite quickly. Social enterprises are beginning to use us. Um, those of you who may have been with us a few weeks ago and heard from Richard from Purple Shoots was talking how they're utilizing Belbin. Then we have wonderful other companies like Bowles who are great at outdoors and do so much brilliant stuff with, with young people. Um, independent consultancies, River Re, et cetera, um, and also business schools. I'll pause there because business schools around the world, be it um, the judge here at Cambridge, Cranfield, um, Edinburgh Business School, Asade, um, so many business schools, they don't just talk about the theory, they use the Belbin reports. Because it's all one good thing about talking about it, isn't it? But the best way of learning and understanding how to use it is to, to actually use the reports themselves. Okay. Without further ado, should we look at one of these reports? I think we should. Now, I've either been very foolish or just a little bit naive. I'm not entirely sure which one, or perhaps just a bit too open, is I decided I'd use one of my reports um, back in 2019, and I'm going to talk you through it. And I think it's useful because it's honest and I can give you some insights, more so than I can if it was a, a fictitious report. So I'm just going to share my screen here. Yeah, as you can see, this was completed in 2019. I've got seven observers. What are observers, you may want to know? Well, when you complete the self-perception inventory, you complete it online, not, like I said before, on a bit of paper. Um, and you have eight sections to the questionnaire. And within each section, there's a statement. And then you have 10 potential, um, sorry, and then um, 10 potential statements pertaining to that. That, that statement and um, you have 10 marks and you have to decide where you're going to allocate them you can't do each one out of 10 it's a total of 10 so perhaps if only two of the statements you felt really strongly about you'd give them a five and a five perhaps if you felt really strongly about five statements equally you'd put two 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 um, so on and so forth and this gives you an idea of how you see yourself but remember, Belbin measures behavior. It's not a personality tool. It's there to measure what you do, not who you are. And so we need a validity check. We need somebody to say, well, actually, 
how you think you behave, the contributions that you're making when working with others, we see something different. Um, we need to validate that. So we ask for observer assessments. Observer assessments are there. They're just a, a, a list of words that you get people who know you well and have worked with you to tick, and they inform the report. So my report here has seven people feeding back. Lucky me. Hey. OK, so these are it's my report. So this first page is saying, According to you, Joe, these are the strengths you see in yourself. They see from your own perspective, coordinator and shaper are your top contribution. You see on the right hand side, we have that preference, because it's just me. Um, those two, we have manageable roles. They're ones we can play potentially. Um, perhaps we need to be encouraged to play them more. Perhaps we haven't had the opportunity to. And then we have those least preferred roles. And with these least preferred roles, it's really key that you understand that. And also to understand that perhaps instead of investing a lot of time and effort to make everything go up towards the right hand side is to find somebody who work, work with you, who's actually got your least preferred roles as preferred roles. This is just based on what I think, and you see the statement there. How would you use this? Well, you'd, it, on a one-to-one -one situation, you would use this and say, do you agree with this? more likely than not, the person says yes, because this is a bit that they're filled in about themselves. Yeah, there shouldn't be any surprises. You've filled in a questionnaire and the question, the report should really feed that back to you so, to some extent. I mean, there's lots of algorithms and lots of data behind these reports, but people shouldn't be so surprised. But this is a great one to start a conversation. The fact that we can be, we're a bit of everything. It's not just yes, yes and nothing. We're, we're a bit of everything. Um, and we're looking at percentiles here. This is a key thing because you're comparing yourself to our database. And we're saying how much of you, how much of that team role are you showing compared to the norm? And the norm database for the self-perception inventories, we've got 190,000 self-perception inventories all worldwide. It's an international database that we're comparing you to. That means that if you score on the 90th percentile, it means that only 10% of that population um, and we also have an observer database as well, and that's based on 648,000 observer responses. Okay, a really great starting point for people to understand that they're a wonderful mixture of all of these behaviours. But what, does other, what do other people see? What are other people seeing? And this is where people that you've worked with, people you trust, people you know you well, have filled in that questionnaire, the observer assessment, and they've ticked words. There's a list A, which they're positive words, and the list B, which pertain to the weaknesses, because we all have them. And this is showing really what they've, showed, what they've seen in terms of team roles. Um, we've changed all of those ticks into team roles. There's, again, lots of algorithms in the background. And this is really useful, because I asked seven people, my observers for feedback, they see my top two team roles as resource investigator and shaper. Do you remember that was different to the way that I saw myself? Um, they identify that I possess board and outlook, outgoing, competitive, caring. Oh, that's nice. Um, someone who sees as opportunities and impulsive. Okay, interesting. Now, this is a really useful page to use, especially if we're doing a one to one, because what you don't want are the list B words, which are the associated weaknesses, to be greater than the strengths. Now, what we say at Belbin, it's really important to understand that everybody has this be everybody has associated weaknesses I'd be really worried if I was feeding this back and I didn't see anything to the left of that line because it means people are hiding them um, it means it's, it's expending too much energy to make sure that people aren't seeing those negatives they're just seeing the positives what we don't want there to be is you see my complete finisher at the bottom there it doesn't really matter because it's so small we wouldn't spend time there it, it's quite insignificant but if that was a lot larger with the same proportions, that would be a concern because obviously those weaknesses would be massively outweighing those strengths. And what happens there is people are knowing you for the weaknesses of a team role, not as much as the strengths, and that's where problems can happen. So it's really good here. Um, and also I think this is a wonderful page to show that people see not just, you're not just one thing, are you? There's, there's a bit of color in there for every team role. They are seeing different elements of each of them. So what does this mean? Well, we put this data together 
So we amalgamate the observers and we compare them to the self. So we can see yourself, how you see yourself compared to how others see you. This is powerful stuff. This is more than a I am a or this is me. This is really useful, especially when you're sitting down on a one to one. Why do people see oh, a coaching conversation? Why do people see different strengths? So here it says, I see myself as somebody who's usually confident, who has a social mature manner and who is able to bring out the best in colleagues. If they're different strengths than you do, we're not saying no, we're saying, but they see other things. They see your energy, your social boldness and your inquisitive nature, which usher in new opportunities. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. OK, so this is starting to have a conversation of understanding how you think, what you think you're contributing when you're working with others compared to what other people actually see and value um, in you. So this is a great time to think, OK, why might that be? When is there a situation when that has happened? And what do all my observers agree on? Well, they say you're able to see the bigger picture flourishing when meeting new people and have a strong desire to succeed and win a little bit competitive perhaps and you can see that can't you so in that resource investigator the, there is a quite big difference between myself and my observers roughly the same for the shaper there's not much in it self-perception for my coordinators a bit higher than than the others are seeing but they're still seeing it it's not saying they're not seeing those team roles but just in different proportions what they are seeing, however, is a far higher amount of teamwork than I see in myself. They don't see the plant that obviously I have. Um, <laughs> and you can see, there's, as I said, the completed finish of the monitor, they're really low. I don't see them in myself and others don't see them either. That's OK. So really useful information. Again, I'd always say if I give these reports out before an event, if you haven't had an opportunity for one to one, people really need to sit down with a cup of tea and go through these. We have a worksheet people can go through as well to get more understanding. So this next page puts all of this data together. And we have waiting behind with all that, like I keep using the word al algorithms. Um, I'll keep using that actually because it's a really complicated system. I found that out about 10 years ago when we started to, to start the planning for Interface 8. And I had, I knew it was complicated, but my goodness, um, my non specialist brain almost exploded. Anyway, um, so what we have here is what does this mean? This Actually, I'll tell you who put this really nicely was um, one of our distributors in India, um, Pearl D'Souza. And she always described us, and she's quite right to, as the letter from Meredith. Because Meredith used to write these reports by hand. This is the reason why we got the reports um, generated by a computerized system, is because he was writing and writing and writing. There's only so much or so much writing that a man can do within 24 hours. Um, so this was him saying, OK, so this is this is what it looks like. What does it mean? The letter from Meredith. Obviously, we've updated the, the, the words in the English because it was a little old fashioned. Now we've brought it up to date. Um, so here for me, I appear to be an energetic, driven individual with an affinity for knowing how to react in fast moving situations. Yeah, fair. I think that's for anybody who knows me. Yep, fair. Um, and it will go on and give me some advice on how to play those roles. As a manager, seek out conscientious individuals who do not want to share the limelight. You will work best with somebody who's diligent in tying up loose ends and ensuring that important details are not overlooked. Wonderful advice. And I work best with the people in the office who do just that. It's also looking at, well, I need to take account of the role for which I am least suited. Sometimes my judgments are a bit swayed by emotion um, rather than, you know, taking the emotion out rather than that monitor evaluator. Just be conscious of that. Be aware of that. Don't try and take the emotion out, but be conscious that this is what can happen. This is critical stuff. And like I said before, we don't want this just to be for somebody who's on a management course or doing a level five, something or other. Or this can be for anybody because anybody would find this beneficial. Again, what we've got here is some advice for that individual. The working environment, where would you be best suited? Present yourself if perhaps you are an interview, be it internal or external. Um, if you were meeting people just for the first time, if you wanted people to know where your strengths were, how could you present yourself so that people were in no doubt? Where are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? 
Now, this isn't based just on your top two or your top three. This is based on how much of each of those two moles are present as well. So you could have somebody who has the same one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ranked T moles as you, but you may have different pages here, depending on how much of each of those T moles that there are. Now, this page is really useful. Now, this page is really useful. We'll talk about team reports in a sec. I love this page when everybody has it printed and you're all sitting around because you're about to start a new project. Because this tells you where each person is best suited when it comes to their working styles. Here for me, you've got exploiting opportunities, and controlling. Where would I best be suited? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not at the end, is it? It's not at the checking stage. <laughs> it's not at doing any of the work stage. It's perhaps at the idea stage and the driving and the energy to get everybody through to the end. But if everybody has this page of the report, you can start allocating the right people to the right task. This is a great page for managers to have for each of the people within their team to make sure that you're playing to people's strengths as much as you can. We've still, we've still got pages to go. I mean, there's so much here. The next two pages are looking at the detail. So this page here is saying, this is Joe, your, your self-perception. So you, you see yourself as coordinator, shaper, resource investigator, blah, 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 team worker. Then this is saying with the observers, what team roles they see. Now we're often asked you know, by observers, can people see which words I ha they have ticked? And the answer is no. There is an exception, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but what we're saying is, but you can see which team roles they see in you. And you can see the ranked order, not how much, but the order of the team roles they see. This is a great one, again, when you're sitting down with somebody. Did you know, why does, some, why does Stephen see you differently? Why does he see the team worker where nobody else does? What is your relationship you have with Stephen, Joe? Why is it that he's seeing a different behaviour? Why is it that Nigel Belbin um, sees really high implementer? Why... Because we change, don't we? We change our behaviours depending on the people that we're working with. So different observers are going to see different things because we're not robots. We're not the same thing to everybody all of the time. And it's really useful to know how we adapt and change our behaviour depending on who it is that we're working with. This is really useful stuff. I'll keep saying this because it just is. You can have a webinar, I think, on each page of these um, reports because there's so many ways them but this one's a good one and you may see that sometimes there are patterns and you'll see there's patterns from people perhaps who you manage and those that manage you and your peers um, sometimes we do change our behavior when we're managing up um, as well as when we're managing others it's quite an interesting one to see how much people are adapting their behavior and then the last page um, coaching conversations is all I'm going to say here. This is all the words that are on the observer assessment and how many times they were ticked. Now, I've got seven observers and the maximum any word can be ticked is twice. You can give something a double tick, which means that the maximum for me with seven observers would be 14. So if everybody gave me a double tick for broad in Outlook, I would have 14 there. Now, if that happened, then obviously I would know that everybody had given me a double tick. And even if it was 13, I would know that everybody, bar one who gave me a single tick, ticked that word. So that's the only way you can work it out. But otherwise, you can't. Coaching conversations, people see board and outlook, outgoing, competitive, caring, sees as opportunities, then they've got impulsive there. Now, this is 2019. So it's I even forget what year we're in now, four years ago, I've got no idea. Um, and I got this report back and I was a little bit taken aback with the impulsive. I know I can be, but I didn't realise I could be so much that it was appearing in the, in, in the top 10 words there. And I was chatting to somebody in the office actually before this webinar and I said, I wonder if that would still be so high up. I need to redo uh, my Belbin report because I've been really, really working on that. And that's why we talk about coaching conversations. Which words would you prefer higher up and which ones would you prefer lower down? To me, impulsive is really important to bring down. Because if it's impulsive, you're not necessarily going to go with them all the time because you don't think things are being properly thought through. What I've been coaching myself on with that is that when I think, oh, well, just do it, I now count 
I go, hang on a minute, but I think we need to ME, monitor, evaluate this first. So I have that stock phrase now. And it actually works beautifully because it makes me realize that I haven't thought it through. And that, in fact, I am just going to sit back. We're going to think through. I'm going to work with somebody in the office who is a high monitor evaluator before we potentially do that or not. So seeing that impulsive so high up for me was a real eye opener. Enterprising, challenging, hard driving. OK, encouraging of others. Manipulative. That's OK. I can explain that one. Impatient. I am very impatient. That's fair. But do I need to be in conscious of that? Because if you're so impatient, again, it's a negative effect. How can I work on my impatience so that people, it, it, people aren't so um, affected by it? Confrontational. Same again. I want these words slightly lower down. Um, what did I want higher up? Well, conscious of priorities. I wanted that word to be far higher up. We can see only four ticks out of a possible 14. So these are things that I have been working on um, to try and improve not just how I think I should be, but what the team needs me to do, because the team really does need me to be a coordinator. Conscious of priorities is one of those words that really is an intrinsic part of coordinator. I need to get that higher up. So it gives me great insight into that. OK, so we'll move from there. That was my report. That's an individual report. It's the eighth version of the reports and it has so much information. And I think on a one to one, you can get so much from this. If you're accredited, you don't have to be accredited to use these reports. But if you are, the amount of information you can get from those on a one to one is, is fabulous. And how a lot of people use these is that they have the individual reports. They talk on a one-to-one -one first before they run the team session. So to everybody to understand themselves really well before you start sharing that information and going with the team. I'm just gonna go through a couple of other reports. I'll go through quite quickly, but I want you to see the differences. Um, I want you to see how varied there are. There are over 100,000 words um, involved in these reports. Um, goodness knows how many trigger points and algorithms and everything else as well. So this is Victoria Yellow. You can see again those preferred roles, those manageable, those least preferred roles. Um, again, there's not so much on the left-hand side here, but there still is stuff on the left-hand side. We're still seeing weaknesses. We're still seeing a smattering of all of those team roles. Looking at those differences, well, the specialist is very much agreed upon. The others, they'd be interesting conversations. There's a bit of a difference, isn't there? But the others agree, the specialist is head and shoulders above the rest. Again, what does this mean when we put all, all the data together? The working environment. Be aware of your weaknesses. You may be um, unwilling to allow others to share your work. That's interesting, isn't it? It's because perhaps a little bit territorial there, not wanting um, others to, to be part of what you're doing, but some wonderful strengths to work in professional fields where experience and ability counts, perhaps more than people management. That's where you need to be. This is where I need to put my hand up here. This is, this is the role I need to play. So again, completely different to mine, this refining, researching, calculating, improving. Where would we put Victoria Yellow in a team? What role would she play within a project? How coherent is her profile? You can see the specialists coming up there massively. And again, those perfectionist, studious, dedicated to subject. And I'm just going to quickly go through another one, Stuart Brown. Um, now, this is an interesting one, because as you can see with Stuart Brown, just the top tip on their monitor evaluator, nothing else. That's all Stuart sees is monitor evaluator. Interestingly, other people do see things. So sometimes when we feel we're just one, that we only have one contribution to give to the team, actually there are other contributions that other people see and value as well. Well, apart from the shaper. <laughs> they see no shaper here. And some of that resource investigator or some of but it should be fine because it's, it's again, it's quite a small amount. This is interesting, isn't it? This is a monitor evaluator, monitor evaluator. Um, yes, everybody agrees. Look at that, it's head and shoulders, which means there's a difference in this page of the report because normally this page of the report would look at your top three team roles and your bottom team role. But because this monitor evaluator is incredibly high, it's giving 
different advice based on just a monitor evaluator and a little bit of the plant name. See the plants coming through a little bit. But it's actually bearing in mind that one is just a super, a super monitor evaluator. Again, those strengths and weaknesses. Um, be even handed an objective when assessing situations. Um, great problem solving abilities, work when in a think tank, job involving long term planning, acquiring a sense of vision. Others say making sound judgments on business matters. You know where to, you should be using Stuart Brown. And because that top team role is so high, look at these top four. It's now actually a top three team roles here for the suggested working styles. Solving problems of logic, rational creativity, correcting and observing. Again, why are there some differences there? And what are the words that are being used? Shrewd, studious, perceptive, logical. Words aren't being used. This is quite an interesting one as well. So it's interesting to see where they're the zeros as well as where there have been ticks. Okay. So they're the individual reports. They are wonderful on a one-to-one. -one. They are great for managers. It's a good way of people to see where they have strengths they didn't realize that they had. So these are great for growth mindset. These are great for understanding where else you can be used. Without that feedback from other people, we, we get very blinkered. Yes, I can play that because I am A. What we're looking at is really saying, well, what does the team need me to play? Oh, I can, I can play that one. Um, so the individual reports are, and also there, it's not just done. I know some other things people say, well, I've done that. Well, like I said before, that was my report from four years ago. It's constant, you're constantly changing, learning, growing, developing. So make sure that you redo your Belbin every two to three years. Um, ensure that you are, you have listened to your observers. You have developed perhaps those team roles a little bit more because things change, don't they? Things change, our environment changes, whether we're working from home, all these things change our behavior. So we need to make sure that we can identify that and we can use that. So, okay, everybody's got their individual report. You've had time to sit down and have a one-to-one. -one. Everybody's happy. They understand that this, these are the strengths that they have. How do we use it when we pull everybody together? Well, in an ideal world, you have a team and you have the objective. And then you can think about what behaviors are needed for that objective to be reached and then you start thinking about the people i think what people can we bring in um, to be able to play a particular contribution for that team to be successful so what we can do is put all of this individual data together and just see what that team might look like look who might play certain roles look who would be best suited what contribution does everybody make? so here we've got just a, a team report from sample group that's imaginatively named isn't it and as a facilitator what you have is a list of everybody's overall profiles looking at the self and the observers this is really useful if you're doing any pre-work then we have what contributions potentially could each person bring to the team so the resource investigator when the team needs to exploit new opportunities turn to and it will tell you who to turn to there Interestingly here, it says there's nobody showing the strengths of the plant team role in, in abundance. So it's not gonna just name anybody who's, who's got the highest plant, yep, you're in. It's gonna do it carefully. And if there isn't anybody suitable, it will say so. Um, for the shaper, we have Joe Pink. Uh, for the monitor evaluator, Stuart Brown. Um, interesting, we have three completed finishes. That's not normally heard of, is it? Jill Purple, Peter Green, and so you're understanding the potential contributions that everybody needs to make. You then have this, the good old team circle. And you have this. Now, this is just based on people's top two team roles, not how much of each of those team roles, but just their top two. And how do people use this? As a starter of the conversation for the team. As a facilitator, you may do as we do. And we, we have these, um, I think they're A1 size um, sheets, and we have sticky just put everybody's name on a sticky pad and you almost replicate what is on the team report. The conversations need to be, where are the gaps? Where are the overlaps? Who do we need to develop and help to play a role because the team needs it? Where do we have to get people to change their role because there's too many? 
this really does start so many conversations with the team. It also highlights difference. And this is not just different, we've got different energies, we're all different personalities, whatever. We are all making different behavioral contributions that the team needs us to succeed. And embracing that difference and that diversity of behavior is what the team needs. So to be able to play with this is wonderful. We're, if you're accredited, you'll know that we have a wonderful exercise where we start using this, but also with the strong examples. Um, you only put your name up if you're on the 80th percentile or higher. Um, and then it's a very different, it's a very different picture um, normally. It's a, about helping and supporting everybody to make the contribution they need to make. The next page is great for succession planning because it is highlighting um, the person with the highest percentile for that team role against the average for the team. So as we can see here, we've, this is actually quite a high performing team um, because we've got most people. There's, there's a contribution for most team roles above 80 with the exception of shaper and plant. Um, so normally we say as long as everybody knows the role they need to play. There's, there's some great stuff there to, to use. But say if, um, let's have a look here. Who's the high ME? Stuart Brown. So if Stuart Brown were to leave, because there's such a big difference between the self, the 100 percentile, and the average for the, the team, 40. If they were to leave, how much of an impact is that going to make um, on the team if they lose that monitor evaluator? Because they're using, losing a lot with Stuart. This is really good for your managers um, to practically use Okay, where do we have? What do we need to look out for? Is so and so going to be seconded? Are we going to lose somebody? Using this information is really important. We then have those strong examples. So we may have those top two, but where are they? There's no strong example, like we said, for plant and for shaper. There's nobody showing that team role so much that it's going to definitely make you know a massive impact on the team. How can you help? Who are the ones who are just below the age? How can the team help them? develop and then we look at the team all averages or the culture of the teams we put all of that data together so this strong has a team has a strong service orientation with the willingness to do what is needed and to do it well complete to finish a team worker however we don't have much shaper down there um, so we really need to make sure that we still have the energy to get going to get to that finishing line so the best scenario and the worst scenario. Again, during a team session, get people to discuss this. Is this what you want your team to be? Is this how you want the team, your culture of your team to be? What would you like to change? How is this going to impact on the work that you are doing? Great, great page to discuss that. As are the words. So we've now put all of those ticked words from everybody's observers together to, again, to give us some indication of the culture of that words are at the top which ones are at the bottom i had a wonderful conversation with a consultant um, who's working over in the us at the moment and doing some great work with some um, energy companies out there and he's just put this together for i think he's got up to 200 um, people so he's doing a department at the moment and he has this data for 200 people you can produce these reports for that amount of people not every page certain pages this is one of them and the board likes are saying this is amazing because how are those words aligning with our corporate culture which words do we want low down the same as an individual which ones do you want higher up what does this say about this particular department and also how is it can compare with other departments when he's done the work there as well you need data you need to make informed decisions about your team, about individuals, about your departments, about your organizations to make informed decisions. You need to have data. And that's what the album reports give you. It's what they offer you. These team reports, I would say, are best used by um, a facilitator um, because you've got the data there or by the manager. Um, you need to be able to explain um, perhaps why somebody isn't on the strong examples um, report, for example. So you have the individuals, you have the teams, and then you have the working relationships. Now, the working relationship reports you can generate and you can decide on the relationship between two people. So here we have Stuart Brown and Victoria Yellow. They're working together. But I'll put Stuart Brown as the manager of Victoria Yellow because that makes a difference to the way in which they are going to work together. 
So we can say here that this team role combination may work well together when Stuart Brown can make strategic use of Victoria Yellow's special expertise. And Victoria Yellow can appreciate Stuart Brown's logical approach to problem solving. How are these used? I love these reports when teams are first and it's almost like a speed dating and people can have these pages of the reports to be able to work out the relationship that they're going to have with each member of the team. Using these along with the individual reports by saying how I prefer to work is having those conversations right at the beginning helps start communication. It starts helping that trust, the psychological safety. All of this starts by communicating how you prefer to work and how together you're going to work best. These reports are really practical and a great start for any team session. Um, you can see here, Chip Stuart Brown is the manager of Joe Pink. You can see the differences there we have, but what does that mean in terms of our team roles? So much to go through. These reports can be used in a myriad of ways. Um, I mean, not all of the reports we're talking about today either. We also have job reports and they're helping match people to jobs. Um, so much out there in the Belgian interface platform. Which actually, I'll just show you very, very briefly. Well, oh, this is gonna be a test of my skills. Um, I think it's that button. I think it's that button. That button, share. Yes, you can see it, it's okay. So here is the Interplace program um, platform. Anybody can register to go on this. Just go to interplace.belbin.com, register, and you will see what you can do. You can generate all of the other reports. I've got resources there as well. Now I've put a team report here, I've added all these people. They've all completed their reports, look. And I want to put them together as a team. What is it going to look like? OK, well, if I had all 12 people available, because I don't, um, I could say, OK, that's interesting. But I am actually know that Stuart isn't available. I know that Ali isn't, or Lisa. John, not sure about. Dave, again, not sure. And Jean-Paul, not sure if they can make it either. What does that mean? I can start playing with this as a manager to work out which of the team roles I really need right now, which of those behaviours I really, really, really need right now. And are they available to me? Um, you can even search on the database for somebody who's a high shaper if it was that you couldn't find them anywhere else. So as you can see, you can really start playing with the impact that having everybody in the team has. And then when you're happy, you can choose those people and generate a team report. So you can just see how much difference does that make. Generate the report and um, that will happen. So I just thought I'd show you that because it's, it's an interesting um, way for managers or for the team themselves to work out how to use everybody. Just to say in here, you also have plenty of resources um, that you can use. Um, you can generate all of the other reports. The resources, if you're accredited, um, how many you get, let's just click on there. And you can see all of the resources if you're Belvin accredited that you can download, including all the, the posters behind me. So please do have a look at that. You also have plenty of other resources in the premium section. And also we have a free section too. So don't worry, there's plenty for you to download. Okay, I need to stop sharing. I need to click here. Oh, it's just too technical. Okay. So we've gone through the reports, shown you a little bit about the programme. How do people use them? They use them as a one-to-one -one coaching. And most of them are team um, conversations. Using this as a way of starting the conversation. Using this, which team roles do we need? And who is it who can play that team role? And who are we going to support if perhaps people are playing out of their first, second or third team role? Um, so this is where the conversations really do start and do happen. Costs. Well, I, I, I personally think that the, the value in these reports is phenomenal. Um, and they can be used again and again um, in so many situations. And it's just that they're practical. The language is written to you. It's not um, written for somebody to interpret. So they have so much value in the hands of the person whose report it is, not just um, the person who perhaps is, is feeding it back. So the costs, let's just put that up here. Um, this is a slightly confusing slide, perhaps. Let me just, um, there we go. So you create a 
an account and you've got access to all of these reports. How do much they cost? Well, for those of you who have um, children who love um, getting credits um, for their games that they're constantly on, um, you'll be familiar with the concept of credits. So each report uses up an amount of credits. And so for the individual report, you can have 10 credits, the team report, 20. Those working relationship reports at the moment, you can create as many of those as you like. And they have the job reports and the comparison reports. So the idea is, as you work out how many credits you may need now, or how many credits you may need over a period of time. And that's the better one, because that's where the cost does come down. And this is how much those credits are going to cost. So I've got three worked examples here. So if you had a team of seven people, you want each of them to have an individual point. And that does include the observers. They're, they're not extra. That, that's part of the report. And you'd like a team report. So you've got seven individual reports at, at 10 credits each and one team report at 20 credits. Total net number needed, 90 credits. And that's going to cost £351 plus the 80. So you had a department of 100 people and you had 15 teams. So you'd have 100 individual reports, so that's 1,000 credits. 15 um, team reports, so that's 300 credits altogether. Refer to the table and that. 640. If you want to get the most cost effective option, think about what you may need for the future. So if you're an organization of 700 people and multiple teams and you want to implement Belbin over a 24 month period, you want to take your time doing it. Why not just purchase 10,000 credits? Um, and that's going to cost 15,000 pounds. These credits don't expire. We're not going to take them away if you don't use them. And so it's a really good idea to think about the future because um, it really does make it a really, really cost effective tool. And if you're looking at different numbers or your situation is slightly different, perhaps you are a social enterprise or a charity, just, just give us a bell. Please do phone and we will be able to talk to you um, through that the best um, costs for you. We want to make sure that everybody has the ability to use Belbin. Okay, remove that. Back to me. Here I am. Um, so, Belbin. It's not just about talking a theory. It's not just about understanding the team roles. It's about everybody understanding the roles where they have strengths and weaknesses in, to be able to share that with the team and for the team to understand that, to have great communication and for working relationships to really um, flourish within that team. So like me, you get to know who you need to work with. Yeah, I need to work with the monitor evaluators, complete and finishers. We know this. We're very different, but my God, we need each other. Um, but to find this out, it isn't, you can't guess. You can't go, well, where do you think you are? This these Belbin reports are a combination of, of years and years of research, and they are written in a language for you, for your team, for your managers, for everybody to understand. It's a practical language. There's a myriad different ways you can use these reports. And as we've just seen, they're really like the bank. Um, if you're doing a day delegate rate for somebody um, because you're taking the team away for a day, the Belvin reports really aren't going to add much more um, to that. So please think about using them. If you would like to find out any more information, you know where we are. We're a team at belvin.com or um, you can just phone us, find us on our website at belbin.com. Um, we do answer the phone, we're in the office and we don't really have an answering machine unless it's after six o'clock. Um, so please just give us a bell and talk through your needs and how you can use the data um, of the Belbin reports to help your teams and your organizations to help you make really effective decisions. So thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate you spending the time with us and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. I'll just quickly check whether or not there's any questions there that we need. OK, cool. Well done, Tracy. You've been keeping a good eye here on the hip. Fantastic. Your observers need to be people whom you have worked with for at least three months and whose feedback that you really do trust. And the ideal, um, when you have to have a minimum of four observers, we're not going to feedback with any um, fewer than four. So a minimum of four, a maximum, well, the maximum can be 
well, how many people do you really work, work closely with would be my question. We say about six to eight, any more than that. And I'm not sure of the benefit that you would get from that. Um, so just to say, um, yes, you observe as people you've known well and who you work with. This is a work-based tool. It's not about how the person down the pub sees you, your mate sees you, your husband, your wife, your daughters. That doesn't matter because we're talking about how you behave in the workplace. So please make sure you have that. Okay, Lisa, thank you. If I want to pitch my director to use Belbrum, how do I make sure he doesn't think it's on you? Share my Belbrum report. Um, I'd go onto our website and I would show him the reports that you can download, the sample reports you can download there, and also a list of our customers, um, which you'll find scattered all over our website to show if the UN are using it. Um, the World Bank, if um, Sanofi, so and so, I really would, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just show him who, who's using it at the moment. And there's so much research and data there on our website, Lisa, that you could um, could show them. So please do. Um, Belbin's been around for a long time because it works. I would just say that as well. We're on our eighth version. Um, and the reason we're still here as an organization is because Belbin, it, it works. It's very voluntary and it does what it says on the tin. OK, thank you very much, everybody. I will now let you go and have your cups of tea. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.